So I'm Hannah, one of the festival crew, and I'm really, really pleased to be joined by Amadeep Dillon for our session, Mutual Aids to Cooperatives. So a little bit of housekeeping before we start. You can ask questions in the session chat box, which is on the right hand side, um, which we'll be answering yet yeah, after we've given Amadeep a little bit of chance to tell us all about what he's up to. Um, and you can also, if you want to, once we're ready for question and answer, you can, if you're feeling brave, share some audio and video to ask your question in person, whatever works for you. The session is being recorded, some catch up viewing that should be available this evening. So to introduce our wonderful speaker, uh, Amadeep is a bartender at the Ivy House, a founding member of South London Bartenders Network and Nun Head Knock, an editor at Red Pepper Magazine and a freelance journalist. And I think you're writing us an article for the next issue of Stair Magazine, I believe. I am, yeah. Well, writing is a, I tend to call them, but yeah, let's go with writing. Cool, definitely. let's do that, yeah. And um, you were at our festival last year, um, so it's really, really lovely to see you again. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, uh, yeah, thank you so much for having me. Not at all. So yeah, I guess just to frame our session a little bit, um, we're saying sort of like, okay, so as the crisis gives way to the new normal, what is whatever the new normal is many are looking beyond mutual aid for models of continuing sustainable community support so it'd be great to hear from you what do you think about that yeah well i mean um it's a really interesting one because I, I think when I, i'm going to go rogue because that's what i always do when i agree to to speak um i kind of start started off this you know maybe maybe a few months ago i think i pitched the talk thinking about um because I've been heavily involved in mutual aid, thinking about how to make it more sustainable and thinking about the opportunities for the co-op movement. Um, and actually, I, I think if I were to reframe that, you know, given the conversations I've had in the interim, it would be much more about um, the internal opportunities for the co-op, what the co-op movement can learn from mutual aid, and also rather than opportunities, kind of the dire need for cooperative structures in some of the mutual aid efforts um that i've been involved in i mean it it seems like you know an entirely different world now to this time last year like right? we're post the 2019 election defeat we're mid-pandemic and pe we are still mid-pandemic people forget what we are um and but the last six months uh and mutual aid especially has taught me that there is still hope for a better world there's still definitely something to fight for um but we do need to fight for it and plan for it because uh things are about to get a, a whole lot worse unfortunately so um, I'm just going to talk a bit about what mutual aid is and what it is in, in a COVID-19 context, which has, has become something quite specific and quite distinct. So um, in March, I think it was, um, a bunch of neighbours and mates in Lewisham set up the first COVID-19 mutual aid group. Um, at that point, the government hadn't announced any real significant measures. Um, it hadn't announced imminent lockdowns. It was clear to many of us that the UK was on course for preventable deaths uh, as a result of a failure of cohesive public health policy and messaging. Um, so focused on immediate needs, um, the efforts of the Lewisham Mutual Aid Group um, included picking up prescriptions, delivering groceries, dog walking, regular check-ins for shielding and isolated people, particularly those who are immunocompromised and those who are older. Um, but the, the term mutual aid actually has its roots in um, the writings of Peter Kropotkin, who was an early 20th, 20th century anarchist. And uh, it can be summed up as a, a group of people organizing uh, to meet their own needs outside the formal frameworks of charities, NGOs, and government. So it's been used to describe the co-op movement actually, and it's been used to describe uh, historical and current indigenous societies, medieval trade guilds, um, and other networks based on reciprocity and voluntary membership. So I'd argue that um, South London Bartenders Network, which is you know, a, a space for organizing, a space for trade unionism, is also functioning along mutual aid principles, right? Where it's not about outside support structures. Um, it's all self-organizing among workers. Um, and a mutual aid groups operating in a similar fashion has they kind of predate capitalism really um and i think they've been catapulted into the mainstream as a recognizable concept now but if they've been less visible or recognizable to us in the past uh, i think that says as much about the representation and visibility of disenfranchised groups and the language we use to discuss them on the intellectual left 
um, as it does about the erosion of mutual support structures at the hands of capital. Um, so, you know, migrant communities, in particular queer and trans communities, working class communities, um, really have had to form what are in effect mutual aid groups and networks of mutual support just to survive capitalism and, and to survive the society that we're in. Um, so it, it's not a new concept, it's just new in, in, in the public consciousness and in particular in the middle class consciousness, right? Um, so within a few weeks of the first group being set up in Lewisham, uh, tens of thousands of mutual aid groups sprang up across the country. Um, some of them were, you know, coordinated or facilitated or inspired by uh, COVID-19 Mutual Aid UK, which was set up um, by some of the initial organisers in Lewisham. Um, but most groups, you know, if not all, have worked with like a relatively large degree of autonomy. They're not centralised outside of their locality uh, and by and large they're directed by local people. Um, and I guess at this point, because I'm going to be critical, I just want to stress that it's my opinion that mutual aid groups have saved lives, you know, have been absolutely necessary, are to my mind beautiful expressions of the power of collective action and also the will for collective well-being. Um, but much like the, the broad church that we call the co-op sector, mutual aid groups have developed along wildly different lines in response to different tensions that have given rise to you know, very different internal dynamics. Uh, and I just wanna talk a little bit about those dynamics because I think there's a lot that the co-op movement can learn from or needs to understand about its role going forward in these networks. So, you know, as, as anyone in, in the co-op sector will know, community serving work actually first involves community construction, right? Community building. The idea that there's a single local community that you're there to serve, like that is just that, that's just an idea. There are multiple overlapping communities within any geographical space. And there are many people isolated from any sense of community who wouldn't identify with that phrase even. And that's true in London, but it's also true elsewhere and in rural areas too. Um, so from the start, mutual aid groups are as much about constructing hyper-local communities as they are about serving existing communities. And it's really important to remember that as members of a mutual aid group, our relative positions within capitalism, so that's class, employment, migration status, all of that, uh, that determines how we see and relate to community serving work, which is done outside of, but not isolated from a wage labor system, right? So the demographic makeup and broader politics that are like implicitly supported by the active majority within mutual aid group, uh, they will drive consensus and determine the direction of the group and what it's for and how it should work and the rest of it. Um, and so generally mutual aid groups have kind of been caught from the start in, um, if I wanted to get uh, insufferable about it, I might call a dialectic, right? Between two poles of, of political political thought um, in a way that I'd argue is analogous to the co-op movement. So on the one hand, mutual aid is viewed as service provision, which is best done in communication with existing local infrastructure. And that includes the third sector and local authorities. But on the other, sort of truer to its anarchist roots, um, mutual aid is viewed as a mechanism that should entirely avoid interaction, ideally, with local governance, the charity sector, the state, or the rest of it. Um, and, and, and both schools of thought have their, ha, have their pragmatism and, and have, have their upsides and downsides, really. So the first school of thought uh, lends itself to kind of, you know, 2011 big society thinking, right? Um, and that essentially justifies a small state by ethically outsourcing welfare provision to charities in the voluntary sector. Uh, we, we saw this, you know, the co-op movement, you know, even, even before that with, with what Blair did in his second term. So funding in particular social enterprises uh, in return for work in the public sector being contracted out at lower than market rate to ethical businesses. Um, and so, you know, it, it functions to situate um, uh, outsourcing of, of, you know, the state's responsibility to local communities. It functions to situate that as something positive and something empowering, um, which I would argue it isn't fundamentally. Um, so just as parts of the co-op movement were you know, used to justify partial privatization, uh, this uh, corollary view of mutual aid, I think will provide ammunition to a government looking to roll back welfare spending post lockdown because communities have come together, you know, mutual aid groups have you know, filled in the gaps. Um, and 
it, it's kind of it's a double bind really we, we had no choice but to mobilize but the fact that we did that's definitely also going to be used against us and local authorities with you know budgets probably looking to be cut again in the near future they're going to look at sectors where mutual aid groups have been active and potentially see those as uh, sources of um, of savings uh, which, which is very damaging I think in the long run so the second school of thought which is a more anarchist one for mutual aid that emphasizes its potential as an alternative rather than a supplementary of existing structures so the problem is that in practice this rarely manifests successfully during a COVID-19 context at least partly due to the scale of the crises uh, and you know that we've had to modify to adapt with and partly due to the demographics of people who've been able to get involved in mutual aid in the first place, right? And uh, demographics in mutual aid groups tend to be overwhelmingly white, overwhelmingly middle class. Uh, and interestingly, um, there's a slight skew towards uh, women as well, taking more of an active role. Um, but so while these two positions kind of might appear to be mutually exclusive, in practice, almost all mutual aid groups are kind of awkwardly straddling both. So in a, in a piece for Red Pepper magazine earlier this year, I argued that in a COVID-19 context, the distinction between mutual and non-mutual aid is sort of a, a false dichotomy, really. Because uh, rather than focusing the debate on whether or not a mutual aid group should engage with local authorities, it's much more honest to think about the fact that we already are, right? There are councillors active on mutual aid groups. We're referring people to different degrees to council services. Some councils, you know, with or without permission, have been referring casework to mutual aid groups. Um, and I think, you know, in, in attempting not to lose the, the political roots of mutual aid, we have to be honest and frank about the limits of our, of our radicality. And that means acknowledging that, you know, the implementation of the politics of mutual aid um, necessitates degrees of compromise in a capitalist society and that's in the same way that you know we see the proliferation of hybrid co-ops or social enterprise rather than you know Rochdale style full worker co-ops right um, but so when I've been writing that piece for Red Pepper I've been in firefighting mode with local mutual aid groups for months I'd spent most of the last six months just like close to burnout and I, and I wasn't the only one um, and it's only recently that, you know, as networks, we've been able to really consider longer term solution to tensions that were thrown up by organizing during lockdown. So I've spoken to, you know, a bunch of incredible organizers up and down the country and like been able to, to look critically at the work that, that we've been doing in Peckham. Um, and so, yeah, I, I, that's why I'd kind of reframe this talk as more about the dire need for the dissemination of cooperative models to allow these networks to be self-sustaining and ready for a second wave that's on the horizon that's going to hit at roughly the same time in all likelihood as mass evictions as renewed austerity and uh, as a recession intensifies that is unfortunately set to dwarf the 2008 financial crash um now i realize i've, I've spoken quite abstractly so i'm just going to like walk you through actually what i've been what mutual aid is and what we've actually been doing so um around around the time that the lewisham group um set up i saw it on social media i thought it would be a great idea to set up a local group in peckham it turns out people in southwark were already mobilizing and uh there was also a group a, a facebook forum called nunhead rocks which is very cute that were trying to organize something roughly within the same kind of parameters they didn't call it mutual aid but that was what they were grasping at really um so i got involved in nunhead knots kind of when it was just like three people having pints in a pub uh, and it's grown massively to something really incredible and really empowering so we've been facilitating uh, weekly check-ins for people who are isolating peer-to-peer -peer mental health support um, for a while we are providing hot food deliveries um, we have been you know delivering food parcels to people who are shielding arranging neighbors to pick up shopping prescriptions dog walking and all of that and and we kind of we try to set set up you know the website and the whatsapp groups as just facilitating community engagement um obviously as as often happens you know within activist or community organizing circles um responsibility kind of becomes concentrated and things tend to get a bit centralized so i was on um i was on the steering committee and very quickly because of this the you know the 
the need for being so involved when we were setting up all these new systems and writing safeguarding policies, there was a kind of natural a coalescing of what you might call power, really, in a centralized system. The work we were doing was still really important. It, you know, it still saved lives, um, but it was more obviously removed from what we were trying to do when we were using a language of mutual aid, right? You, um, you had facilitators, you had volunteers, you had aid requesters. And that's, you know, at its root, that's not what mutual aid should be about. It should be reciprocal and it should be as grassroots as possible. So I, um, I, had, a, I had a talk with Sean Whelans, um, who's a, a giant of the co-op sector, about sociocracy and about cooperative models of organising. And we've, we're now concentrating on trying to devolve power and to devolve responsibility. Um, because I personally would like to see these networks continue. I think they have real material and political potential. Um, and I think that there's, there's a lot more work to be done. But in recent months, it's become increasingly clear, right, that, and this is across mutual aid groups, not just non head knocks, um, that the requests for aid that we were getting weren't really about COVID-19 anymore. Um, this kind of sp spectacle of the crisis, um, actually it became apparent that's not the real crisis that we were fighting. Um, there were issues that predate COVID, you know, that for some reason, for some reason they were insufficiently galvanizing um, on a mass scale by themselves, which should give us all pause for thought, I think. And these are issues like, you know, food insecurity, food poverty, uh, no recourse to public funds and no unlawful evictions, a massive mental health crises that was, you know, um, around, you know, suicide ideation, self-harm, that kind of thing. Um, and we kind of found ourselves on the one hand thinking we're not equipped to deal with this, right? We're just a bunch of we're just a bunch of neighbours. Um, we weren't set up to deal with this. And on the other, knowing that actually this is these were the real crises. These, this is what really needs to be addressed, and mutual role, mutual aid should have a role in addressing these. Um, and yeah, um, and while we were trying to go about doing that. Um, we were kind of casting around for a model that would enable these groups to become self-sustaining. At the moment, it's mainly operating through a website and through WhatsApp groups. Um, and, you know, they have helped strengthen community bonds, they've constructed communities, they've brought neighbours together. Um, but the most obvious route for kind of cementing them structures seem to be the charity sector. Um, and Sarah and John Wood, who's an organiser, um, well, a mutual aid member in Lewisham, um, made a really good point, which is that there seems to be a massive disparity between the actual opportunity for direct action and what we saw over lockdown, which was a massive and overwhelmingly middle class engagement with digital platforms like Deputy, like uh, uh, WhatsApp, like websites, um, offering to liaise and organise support. So a pattern has gradually emerged where there's an instinctive tendency towards depersonalised aid, which is why, you know, the charity sector seems maybe a bit more attractive at first glance. Um, but that's actually oppositional to the type of grassroots responsive organizing that historically has characterized mutual aid. And this is where, this is kind of where the co-op sector comes in. So um, I'd known an organizer called Shiri Shalmi for a few years. Um, I know her through the trade union movement. She's a fantastic organizer. And um, she's also been involved in Cooperation Town, which is a worker co-op uh, started to, um, promote worker cops, um, I think that's right. Uh, and uh, Corporation Town were also involved in setting up a food co-op in, in Kentish Town that actually was set up before COVID, right? Um, the way a food co-op works is, you know, it's an old idea, it's been around for about 150 years. You get a bunch of local people, maybe 20 households to pool their resources to access affordable food. Uh, now, in London, because it's literally swimming in surplus food, um, you can actually get a lot of that food for free. You just need a space to store it, you need a fridge, you need food hygiene, and all the rest of it. But you can get most of your weekly shop for free, and the rest of it you can buy in bulk at wholesale prices. Um, and, you know, this is very different to what we've been doing, where we've been sending out food parcels to be delivered to families that are food insecure. And that's not been sustainable, by the way, where every week we're worried, do we have enough food? Are we able to provide people um, with what they need? So the Food Co-op offers an immediately more attractive method of, of organizing. Um, 
And what I personally would like to see, you know, non head knocks and other mutual aid groups that have been combating food insecurity do is to shift towards facilitating, you know, the empowerment of, you know, working class and migrant communities in particular that says to them, if you want to organize, if you want to set up um, a food co-op and get your, you know, household weekly food bill down to something like a tenner or a fiver in a way that's sustainable, we can help, we can facilitate that. We've got a bit of disposable income, we've got the networks, we know the council, we've got access to community spaces. This is something we can facilitate if you want to take a role in doing it. Because a food co-op is also a work co-op. It's not something you can parachute into a community. It's something that every household has to take an active role in, whether that's you know, updating membership spreadsheets or co collecting dues or um, sorting out distribution and packaging and shopping list and stock taking and all the rest of it. Um, but it's actually relatively low labor intensive once you've actually got things set up. And this kind of, this has spread like wildfire across the South London mutual aid groups that I've been involved in because we've been casting around for a purpose really, a purpose that these networks can, are actually fit to deal with um, in a way that shifts us away, transitions from the charity model towards genuine reciprocal mutual empowerment. Um, and it is also at odds, by the way, with my most of my experiences with what we call the co-op sector, right? Uh, I'm a trade unionist and most of my experience within the sector has been organizing within consumer co-ops and social enterprises. And in those kind of hybrid systems, there's very much a power disparity between the employer and the employee. And in a comparable way, in mutual aid so far, um, there's a relationship between recipient and the helper. Um, Corporation Towns Food Co-ops offered a way to tackle it uh, away from that framework um, with the slightly controversial end goal of the abolition of food banks, which I'm totally, totally on board with. And I think that on the one hand, there are frameworks like food co-ops that, you know, can play a really important role with within mutual aid groups going forward. But it's also important to remember that co-ops that exist have been really important it played really important roles as parts of physical infrastructure at a time when mutual aid was organizing largely in the digital world and was, was to be honest, tending towards a kind of technocratic approach where you have to have access to at least WhatsApp or email, or if you want to get involved and help, you have to have an awareness of certain online systems, right? Certain tech literacy. Uh, and existing co-ops, you know, around the UK, um, as well as community centers and churches and all the rest of it, have provided a way through that, a point of access. So at the Ivy House where I work, um, for a while it was used to cook and package hot meals during the initial stages of lockdown. Uh, the Bevy in Brighton partnered up with a local secondary school to provide meals to families. Um, and Ian from the Bevy at Brighton Food Factory, they're looking at sustainable models for getting local, affordable, fresh, fresh produce to food insecure families in a way that tries to foster a sense of solidarity uh, among kind of, you know, middle class and working class consumers um, rather than a relationship of charity. So I think, you know, it's important to remember that as, as much as I'm being quite critical, there's a lot of exciting work going on. And there's also evidence of the kind of community spirit that after 2019 and the election, to be honest, I'd convinced myself maybe just existed in, in, in the pipe dream of leftists on the internet, right? And at the same time, particularly, you know, in my experience from the perspective of workers, there's a lot to be afraid of too. So we are in the midst of a global pandemic. The oncoming recession is gonna change our experiences of work like almost unfathomably. I don't think we can quite conceive of it, what's about to happen. Much has been said of localized lockdowns, less has been said of localized furlough, for example. Evictions on a scale not seen in recent years on the cards and the benefit system has been squeezed to its most punitive, cruel and inadequate iteration yet. The carceral cosmopolitanism of the hostile environment, which is where we facilitate um, contingent migration across ever more tightening regulations for the purposes of extracting labour from migrant workers, but not actually giving them any security so that we can exploit them more, um, exploit the wider workforce more and then kind of send them back. And we've seen this already with chartered flights from uh, Romania and Bulgaria, I believe, for fruit pickers. Um, that's, that's getting worse. Um, and rhetoric pitting migrants against non-migrant workers is, is reaching new heights, right? Austerity, we're still seeing the effects of austerity 
but the effects are going to worsen and it's going to continue returning in full force. Vital services are going to be cut and businesses that are often at the mercy of exploitative landlords are going to shut down. Any workers who are mobilizing to demand more, we're going to get the blame. <clears throat> now the co-op the co economy and an alternative economy has a really important role to, pay, to play in fighting communities to empower these challenges. But I don't think that it can do that unless we take the opportunity from mutual aid groups around the country to actually look inwards as well and to interrogate the dynamics within, within our sector, within our movement or whatever you want to call it. Um, there's real potential to build on mutual aid networks and in the process to foster genuine cultures of solidarity that can also bolster the efforts of workers and trade unionists in neighboring workplaces, right? This, the, this is a continuation of community construction. Um, but while mutual aid groups are interrogating their internal dynamics and implicit politics by and large, acknowledging, as I said before, the limitations of their radicality, the co-op sector in the past decade has apparently, to my mind at least, been less willing to take action if there has been any analysis in the first place of their own limitations and their own um, biases, if you like, right? So if the co-op movement and, and the new economy is going to play an important role in sustaining mutual aid networks and you know bolstering the trade union uh, movement as well going forward. It's imperative, and I'm going to piss some people off here. I'm afraid um, it's imperative that we actually recognise that there are businesses within this broad church that have interests at odds actively with those who need a cooperative economy the most. There are high profile networks, gatekeeping organizations that validate, for example, social enterprises that pay poverty wages, that employ workers on zero hours contracts or are self-employed even. Um, and these working conditions directly drive food insecurity, food poverty, disenfranchisement, many of the systemic crises thrown to sharp relief by COVID-19, the mutual aid networks are now looking to the co-op sector for help dealing. So, you know, one of the biggest opportunities for mutual aid is undoubtedly the co-op sector, but one of the biggest opportunities for the sector with mutual aid is to begin holding itself and, and our comrades accountable, right? Um, I want us to look around and realize that however respectable some of our friends may be, their current practices are at direct odds with the principle of a cooperative economy. I've seen personally within social enterprises in my locality how poverty pay and insecure work within social enterprises um, and consumer co-ops directly contribute to poor mental health and all of these other issues. We can use co-op structures and trade union organizing and mutual aid networks to empower communities to resist the issues and the absolute um, can't swear, can I? And everything that's kind of on the way, right? The Armageddon that's approaching. But if we're going to do that, we need to do it honestly. And this has to be a touchstone for holding ourselves accountable and having some comradely, but ultimately serious conversations. Because there are friends in the movement that are, that are giving me a lot of legwork to do on the trade union front. So that's kind of, I guess that's kind, that's kind of it. That's quite wide ranging. But yeah, to sum up, lots of opportunities, lots of incredible work happening. Um, we can't afford to be complacent. We have to look inwards as well as building outwards. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Amadi. Great. Well, yeah, I've got some hear hears and some brilliance in the chat section. So I'm really thinking now, yeah, let's just dive in and see. I'm going to read like maybe a couple of comments that we've had just in case you didn't spot them um, while you were chatting and then going to see if anybody would like to hop in and ask us some questions. Um, so I think, yeah, Nathan wrote um, something interesting about doing a session for mutual aid groups on legal structures they could consider using and he was impressed by how they wanted to be political, which was one reason why charity and CIC were not options. So co-op was the natural organisational form. So lots of confirmation that as a model in principle, it is really great, but the culture, you know, we do need to, as you were saying, we need to quite radically look at. Um, and then who else have we got? Let's have a look. Yeah, I mean, just, to, just to come on that very quickly, um, it's important to note as well that um, a lot of mutual aid groups aren't political. You know, all of them are explicitly non-partisan and most of them, you know, some of the drivers behind them are community organizers or, you know, 
at, from the activist circuit, I suppose. Um, but there are equally, you know, there are mutual aid groups that have been doing really important work that are fronted by, you know, local Tory councillors. So I would hate to romanticise it too much. Some of us are fighting to make it more political and the co-op sector is a route to, you know, solidifying that as well. There's a struggle within, within these groups too. Great, so I'm gonna see if, I'm gonna ask a question from Lara, one of our festival crew. So um, she's asked, how would you approach the issue of pay, fairness, company culture within the charity social enterprise co-op sector? A big question. Ooh, a big I need to not question. get myself into trouble here. Ah, um, get yourself into trouble. We love trouble. That's what we're here for. <laughs> oh God. Well, so after after Sir to Action last year, when I spoke a bit more extensively about the trade union movement and you know the wage labour relations within hybrid co-ops and social enterprises, um, I actually had a really productive meeting with someone from one of these organisations, right? Um, one of these uh, umbrella organizations who asked me the same question right which is what can we do to address the fact that we still exploit workers in the corporate movement or within the social enterprise movement um and i laid out quite a clear plan i think um if you're part if you're if you're a gatekeeper essentially right if you're running a lobby group or an organization that gives any kind of resources or power to anyone in the co-op sector there needs to be a requirement um, first of all, uh, within six months of joining, there needs to be a commitment to inviting a trade union organizer. The union movement and co-ops, you know, traditionally have worked in tandem. They were ne they haven't historically been oppositional to one another, right? Um, that, that your, your co-op should be unionized, ideally, and your social enterprise absolutely should be unionized. So to, to let these, to let these businesses in under the umbrella of your network, within, you need to invite an organizer, um, within a year. Uh, they need to commit to paying a living wage and and if they can't do that it's not a viable bi business you know I, i've had so many people say well we're doing community work we can't really afford to now you can't afford to now if you're not paying your workers a living wage because they're going hungry so that you can have a nice seat at the table and talk about alternative economy um so, so th those are two things um i would also I also think it's about bloody time that a lot of these organizations reinstituted some form of democratic worker autonomy or involvement within businesses, right? This doesn't have to be worker ownership. It doesn't have to be that radical, but there has to be some kind of mechanism. If you're running a business that has shareholders, for example, your staff at least need to have shares. And if not as individuals, their union branch can be allocated a share. Um, if it's, uh, if it's, you know, operating along slightly different lines and, and there's not shares, you still need to have working groups, maybe if they're formed of committees, but all. And if it's workers involved in working in working groups as well, they need to be paid for that labor. Um, because it's not the case that you're bringing them in as a nice act to say, let's get involved, isn't all going on well. No, you have the power and the disposable income, the time, the energy to set up what might be a non-profit or what might be a social enterprise this person needs to eat and pay rent. You pay them for their expertise, for their time, and for actually legitimizing your, radi your radicality that you present to the world and get grants off the back of and speaking opportunities and all the rest of it. So there's a bunch of different things. I actually laid it all out and I got ghosted by the very lovely individual who I'd laid it out to. So uh, let's say I'm not holding my breath. Let's, um, let's harass them. Go on, give us a name. No, joking, joking. Can't, can't do it. <laughs> um, Great. Something specifically as well about ownership. We had some really great discussions yesterday um, about we had a panel yesterday evening uh, about ownership in crisis with some of our US colleagues, um, Jessica Gordon-Nemhard and uh, Yancy Strickler. So that was really interesting. So if anyone hasn't seen that, mm -hmm. head over to our Vimeo. I'll pop the link on um, and watch that great discussion. Um, so, yeah, but I suppose, yeah, I suppose it's one of the discussions to sort of say like, okay, so you're you're starting to think about this stuff maybe for the first time, maybe as a response to COVID, maybe not. Is is it also, is it, you know, can it be broken down for people? So, you know, people who are nervous of, of allowing in more democratic ownership and more opportunities for people to be involved, living wage, you know, is there a way of saying, 
you can have help doing this you know there's guidance don't be afraid <laughs> you can do it step by step yeah well i mean i guess this is what frustrates me the most is that we already have big national networks and umbrella organizations in place that are perfectly situated to do this right um like on a personal level like i'm always happy to like i've got you know i'm I've got the speaking opportunity, but I have relatively limited expertise, right? I'm just a bartender who happened to work in a co-op, who happened to get involved in the trade union movement. Uh, there are people that have been, you know, studying this and, you know, long been engaged in the movement for much longer than I have, who are full of expertise, thinking specifically about people like, you know, Sean and Shiri, uh, probably Johnny actually as well. Um, but at the same time, like, it's not 100% feasible all the time for individuals within the movement, which is how it's currently functioning, right? It's individuals within the movement are touchstones. And as I did to prepare for this talk, I went and found them and was like, help, what's going on? Um, and that's fine, that's good, that's solidarity. Um, I think if, I think one thing that, that STIR could be really useful in facilitating would be some kind of shared resource where, you know, things like, um, but you could have people involved in the movement looking in on business models that existed and having Zoom calls, just giving advice on how you can do it better, right? Or how you could improve. Because at the same time, I'm being relatively, um, I'm, I'm, I could, it could be seen as being antagonistic, right? Uh, and that's, that's just the socialist in me. But at the same time, like, I know that a lot of people who own these businesses or who start these businesses, I'm setting out to exploit workers, just not on the radar. You know, where, where, where it's like it's like the beer that you bring in or the coffee grounds that you get, uh, the workers that you get, what's the best value for money. So I think um, I think a resource pack that, you know, could be facilitated by STIR that could be freely available online. That would be good. Someone in the comment section asked for the paper that I um, put together for uh, the unnamed organization. I'm gonna have to try and find it because I'm very chaotic and not like a functional human, but I can give it a go. And like, if I pass it on to Stir, like feel free to just disseminate it or I'll put it on Twitter or something. Um, but uh, yeah, and, and I do think as well, you know, given my experience with, with the South London Bartenders Network, which is um, to be frank, like I think revolution, revolutionizing the way that local trade unionism is done. Um, you can just have like, workers on zoom calls from across the country you can have business owners on zoom calls like it doesn't always have to be going to this conference reading this paper getting this qualification just like dm someone and be like hey anyone up for a chat because that's how i've learned so much about all of the things i've just said to you none of this is original content yeah absolutely <clears throat> and i mean almost sort of bringing in kind of the what we want to do with the festival which is you know asking for people to play with ideas. I suppose one element of that reciprocity is is encouraging kind of creativity and playfulness kind of with each other about how to how to craft, you know, within within the co-op structures that we have, how to craft new ways of interacting with them and using them um, that are more democratic. You know, it's not just it's not just in the articles of association, right? It goes so much beyond that. Um, yeah, right. absolutely. Mm. And uh, sorry, one thing that I actually can't believe I've forgotten to say is that almost none of the, very few of the mutual aid groups that I'm aware of in South London would have been able to do half the work they're doing if it wasn't for Open Collective. Um, Open Collective were the way that we managed to fundraise to pay food supplies, to um, buy, you know, le materials for leafleting, to get print, to get stuff printed as well, um, to get masks made and distributed. Um, a lot of the work that we've been doing and the hardship funds that have been set up, that has been by Open Collective. So that, that, I, that was one really important link that I can't believe I didn't think to put in the bloody speech. Uh, let, retrospectively, can we add that in? Can you cut it and just put it a bit further back? I'll do some editing wizardry. I've, I've put the link in the, I think I've put the right link in the chat if anybody's mm. interested in having a look at that. Um, Oh, that's interesting from Kate. That could we have sociocracy facilitators swapping facilitation in different areas? That'd be a really interesting thing to play with. Yeah, I think that would be definitely really, really interesting. Um, because the the ways that the ways that sociocracy gets interpreted are like quite variant as well, and all of them are like situation specific and often, you know, just best suited to the context in which they're being implemented. Uh, I definitely think that just some kind of facilitation for those conversations would be very very useful definitely 
I'm just wondering from, and I, I suppose, like you were saying, you know, it's really interesting how we sort of within the movement and you were saying just a bartender and it's like, oh, it's the most important job in the universe. Um, but, you know, how um, going through the journey that you've been through, obviously, like I said, a lot of learning, you know, a lot of talking to other people. Laura's asked, you know, is confidence or, or lack of, um, you know, how how crucial is that to to self-organizing um yeah, yeah i think i mean i, th I think it is very, really crucial of course but i think i think part of that comes from having to be honest part of that comes from the privilege of having good support networks right um i for example i never really got involved in activism at uni or anything because i was mainly trying not to uh, top myself uh and like my my involvement in like the movement has been very slow because I've had a lot of imposter syndrome. I like wasn't sure what to do or if I had transferable skills. Um, the best thing you can do is having networks that when when people first get involved in organizing in any capacity, right, the networks they join will determine how they relate to it. So if it's a if it's a pretty closed shop sect with very specific Lenin readings prescribed with a clear hierarchy uh, that don't trust you until you've passed a certain number of tests, that's gonna that's gonna leak into how you view society, right? And that can mess you up quite badly in my experience. Um, but when it comes to you know when it comes to some of the migrant solidarity groups that I've been a part of that you know don't have a hierarchy that have people taking on roles as and when they can you come to a meeting you can vote you can make a decision you can be involved as you want those gave me confidence because i saw people around me just you know i, I realized that there's nothing special about organizers it's not a quality you're not a leader i hate this phrase organic leaders you're not a leader you're someone probably has a bit of time a bit of privilege or conversely like desperately needs it right that's how it goes um and we need to disabuse ourselves of the idea people who start things or found things or you know get organized or whatever are heroic nothing heroic about this it's mutual self-interest it's it's, it, it's the oldest dynamic in the book right um and i, I think com so confidence comes from facilitating healthy organizing spaces just generally as well um but there is also of course you know a personal mental health element and that that is related to personal support support structures um my advice would just be like if you have any ideas just find someone to who has some rough expertise or experience and just chat to them about it because most of us like just love talking about stuff all the time it's why i'm on this call now even though i'm never up before midday normally um yeah right in, yeah, in the comments fun. pizza is also being raised as a as a critical factor math says it mostly not yeah so. I, think, I think this is very very important as well actually and you also need to have sociocratic methods of deciding whether or not to let people that have ham and pineapple on pizza participate for me. That's a tension that I've been involved in that you have to really consider. We need a whole spill out session just to tackle that question because that's that is the elephant in the room, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> ah, amazing. So um oh, someone distracted me with pizza. Who was that? I had a really good interesting thing in my head and then it's totally <laughs> gone. Oh well. Um great, just having a oh Lara again, she's proper on the questions at the moment. But um, yeah, we were having an interesting chat last night actually talking about intergenerational and bringing in young people, older folks, you know, and is the co-op movement suffering with with not listening to different voices, um, you know? So yeah, she's asked sort of, what's, what's your knowledge of kind of intergenerational groups within this? So how many older middle-aged and younger people mix to, to organize? Um, I think I think there's there's a clear disparity because obviously because of the shielding and immunocompromised aspects of the pandemic, right? The a lot of the people that were asking for aid or that we were helping tended to be older, and a lot of the people therefore that didn't have to shield were younger. So there was a clear disparity. At the same time, um, I don't think it's wrong to acknowledge. I don't. I necessarily. I think it was probably unavoidable to a degree that there was going to be an age disparity in who could get so involved when it comes to doing stuff on the ground, right? Um, but at the same time, there have been genuine friendships and connections that have flourished between you know older people and younger people as as they've kind of interacted, and you know older people that have been shielding or that have been unwell in, in the past have also contributed in 
in in other ways you know they've been more active on the whatsapp groups they provided they've been manning the phones doing you know emotional you know peer-to-peer -peer support as well um I, I don't really have the stats for it because we've not we didn't collect any of those um because this kind of sprung out of nothing and just desperate need really uh and to be honest i'm i'm, I'm almost glad we didn't because I, I it gets a bit too much internal review um at the same time I've noticed that older people tend to be more active within physical infrastructure, so within community centers, churches, masjids, mosques, temples, gurdwara, there tend to be more older people who are active. And that again is also to do with the, the, the changes in, in dynamic between religious affiliation between the generations, right? Um, so yeah, and so I think it is, it is tricky. Um, there are networks that older people are already more active in and we don't necessarily recognize those because we don't value them in the same way, I think. But yeah, I think more could be done to kind of upskill older people. There is a technocracy, right? There is a level of, in order, in order to, you know, get on a Zoom call, you have to have access to a computer, you have to be able to use the internet and all of that uh, and, and navigate that. So I think upskilling older people to be able to do that would be one good thing, but also as soon as it's safe to do so, there isn't really substitute for, for in-person face-to-face, organizing, networking, whatever you want to call it. Um, and yeah, I, th I think that there has to be an awareness that we have, we have so much to learn. Absolutely. I wonder if um, one of the things is that uh, we had a really interesting discussion with Matt Potts yesterday in um, uh, talking about sort of bad kindness and mutual aid and how often a lot of us fall prey to this kind of, I'm being really kind and, you know, and it's, and it's really interesting how he was sort of framing that like, you've got so many people who are so used to either being service users or service providers and actually reciprocity is something that we're not used to we kind of will often put ourselves on one side or the other like i'm definitely a service user you know i'm definitely a provider i have no problems of my own and actually it's i'm what i took from that is it's very empowering for people who need help to also provide help and maybe that's a dynamic that's going to help with this power sort of um, or this this culture problem that we maybe have in co-ops at the moment. I don't know. I, I I think so, and I also think I think it's interesting when you said the phrase culture problem. I I had a conversation with um, uh, a, a Palestinian organizer um, called Kareem a few weeks ago, uh, where we talked about the fact that you know a, a lot of the people that were really keen to help when they had to shield or there was an issue with them. We're less keen to ask for help and i think part of that is the framework the charity framework and the shame aspect but you know within migrant and diaspora communities sorry i think that's a bin then uh within migrant and diaspora communities there are often greater levels of an acceptance of like you give and you take right um at, at every sikh temple every gurdwara has a longer hall where like free food is is provided like you go to the temple and you eat it, it's a communal experience uh, it's funded by people that can afford to fund it but anyone goes and eats for free right so that and within you know within within migrant working class communities in particular and diaspora communities uh there are already networks of you know sharing childcare provision for example or sharing the school run um you know cooking for one another all of that um and, and i do think there's a degree to which um the ability to ask for and receive help is framed by your experiences of disenfranchisement. So like, I personally found it a bit harder to ask for help until I kind of did a lot of work to unpacking that. And that's partly because I come from like, you know, a relatively middle class background. Um, whereas at the same time, that's the reason why mutual aid groups are overwhelmingly middle class and white, because these groups already have had to form those networks, have already had to ask and give help. Um, and uh, with, with the casualization of work, with the increase of precarity, with what we're going to see is, I think, a, a tumble really in the in the certainty in the reign of the middle classes. Um, I think really we kind of really have to learn because disenfranchisement is is on the up, whether that's down to migration status or whether it's down to, to precarity and poverty. Um, and unless we actually learn to be able to accept help and and give it and not feel like we've done a good deed. Um, we're going to be in trouble, really. Absolutely. Nice one. Great. Cool. So it just got about 10 minutes. In, so I was just wondering if anybody has any sort of final burning questions um, that that they want to put. That would be really great. 
Yeah. Give me one second. I might have to just go inside and plug no, my laptop that's fine. in. Go for it. Go for it. Let's have a look and see what people are posting comments. Nice. Yeah. Sherry's posted. Regarding older people, it also has to do with the stages of human life too. As we get older, we look more and more internally. Meaning of life stuff becomes way bigger motivator. That's interesting. Um, for some recommendations. But there's actually, yeah, in the in this chat as well, people want to have a scroll through. There's, there's a good few sort of resources that have been posted um, and readings and that kind of thing. So that's really helpful. I mean, uh, yeah, I suppose that almost leads me to say like, I know a lot of people here have are, are within this movement, working this movement. But have you got any sort of recommendations for resources that you'd point people to as a first kind of port of call to 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 delve into this if this is new? Well, to be honest, not all that much. Like I've a lot of this you learn by doing, right? But one thing that I would I would say that is really exciting is um, Shiri Shalmi and Corporation Town. Um, they're going to be bringing out a resource pack facilitating um, how to set up food co-ops, right? Uh, and I believe they'll also be running training sessions. Um, follow uh, Corporation Town. Keep a lookout for that because f food insecurity <coughs> is something that's only going to get only going to get worse, really. And this charity framework that we've all been operating on, it's not sustainable, and ultimately, it's um, uh, it's a bit self-aggrandizing. It's necessary, it's important. Charity is important, right? Don't get me wrong. Um, but there's a power dynamic there. And I think if we're really trying to build an alternative economy to kind of carve out reciprocal mutual communities, we have to do our best to eradicate that power dynamic in the same way that at its you know most functioning form, the co-op sector tries to abolish the, the wage labor relationship between the employer and the employee. And Nathan's just saying in the comments, it's so simple, like, don't get put off. With all of this stuff, I think it's it's so easy to be overwhelmed, isn't it? And like, where do I start? But there are guides out there. And like you said, it's, you know, you can always find someone to talk to about it. And, yeah. and I mean, I mean, start to action. This festival of great resources to start from, to be honest. Yeah, absolutely. Um, even if we can't all gather together, it's, um, I think we still got a really good yeah. kind of, good mingling of ideas and stuff which is great yeah yeah and i guess to, you know to, to anyone that's working within the social enterprise sector in particular if you it, it, you know if you're involved in the business and your workers aren't unionized like don't go away from this talk and think that was like interesting do something about it um if if you're involved in these lobby groups and these big national networks, like actually think what you're actually doing to empower workers, because a cooperative economy is always better than a non-cooperative economy. But, you know, in the same way that you see, you know, greening projects that, you know, are building on uh, redeveloped and gentrified land. It's like, who are you greening it for? Who is this cooperative economy for? Who do we prioritize? Who gets the resources? And I, I think that's that's been a failure since the Blair years, really, of, of the co-op sector, which is that we have this trade-off to get rid of any kind of class analysis in, research, in return for mm. a big pot of money, so we can help privatise, you know, care services, the NHS. And that lays the foundations for the Conservative Big Society, it lays the foundation, you know, it's part of the rhetoric that's used to justify austerity. So that, I, you know, it, I'm not particularly personally interested in any of the really lovely high profile people within our movement who have not incorporated class analysis, not only into their rhetoric, but into their business practices, because they're scared they're gonna lose funding or seats at the table. Like, I just don't care at this stage. I've got workers that can't afford to eat, workers that, you know, can't pay rent. And it's directly because you guys are validating that. It's like, buck up, frankly. Sorry, I, I don't wanna put stir in it, like, Start Action does not endorse this. This is me personally. Start Action loves you and will work with you constructively. I would like to burn your houses down. Absolutely, absolutely. Good bit of stirring, I think. I think that's a great thing to end on. Um, so if you're <laughs> happy, Amadeep, um, if, if, um, let me know if you, <laughs> Maths says stir up, brother. So I agree, let's leave it there. Um, if you want, do you want to wrap up at all? Um, and then I'll just send people off on their way with a little bit of housekeeping. Any last comments? Um, yeah, I just want to say that it's really great to see, you know, so many people actually interested in this and looking for new ways of doing things and looking to, you know, people within the movement looking to continually learn. Uh, that's really encouraging in the same way that, you know, 
the tens of thousands of mutual aid groups that sprung up is really encouraging. Um, I'm just going to end on a little bit of promo, essentially, which is that if you are a hospitality worker in South London, uh, or you know of any, look up South London Bar Tennis Network, we will help you. And if you're a social enterprise or a big organisation that I will not name, and you want to actually do something about the coming absolutely awful recession that we're about to enter, and maybe actually do a little bit for the workers and earn, earn the you know, and the respectability that you've got off the back of the cult movement, you can also DM me and uh, I accept paid work. Yes, paid Thank work, you, absolutely, perfect. Thank you so much, Amadou, that's wicked. Are you hanging around for the rest of the festival at all, or? Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm going to, I've got, um, I've just, I've actually got like a, got to chase up some trade union things, but I'll, I'll be back Amazing. later on Amazing, great, we'll yeah. see you around. Well, fantastic, so a little bit of stuff to send you off on your way. So we've got a couple more sessions on offer before lunch break. Uh, so you can either go to repurposing your organisation or cut the crap conversations about community leadership. So um, if you can't wait and you do want to carry on talking about mutual aid and cooperatives, um, I'll set up a session um area sort of for overspill uh if folks want to carry on talking about this um if they're super interested great so that just leaves me to say thank you so much um deep that's really awesome kicked off some really great conversations which i know will carry through the rest of the festival and beyond thank you so much and thank you to nice the whole team one. thanks well. mate all right take care see you soon